You've done so many polygraph tests, like these lie detector tests. How do you spot a liar? I will tell you this, the best indicators for lying are- Former Secret Service agent, Evie Pomporis. She was part of the protective details for President Barack Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama. Author of Becoming Bulletproof. What about for situations like you're going to interview for a job? How can you exude the confidence you need to get that job? Oh my God, I love this question. Let's break it down into parts. I'm Erica Kohlberg, and you're listening to the Erica Taught Me podcast. So I want to ask, in your career as a Secret Service agent, what do you think is the most valuable skill that you got from it? And did you walk into your career having that skill already? Or is that something that you developed at, through your career? You know what I really learned there? And it might seem small, but it, it's not. I learned to be on time and to be a consistent and reliable person. And you, they had this saying, if you're on time, you're late. And I learned to be on time. I learned to be consistent and to be a person of my word. And I hate to admit that growing up, I, I didn't put that much value in that stuff. And I don't know why I didn't. Maybe because you're young or you're not thinking about it, but it made me a really accountable person. And I love that because it stayed with me. And I've noticed that People know that when they deal with me, if I say I'm going to be somewhere, I'm there. If I say I'm going to call at a specific time, I call. If I say I'm going to do something, I do it. And I feel that, I want to say today, but it does feel like that's kind of fading when it comes to people. It's like, oh, it's okay if I'm this. Oh, it's okay if I'm that. And when you have those habits, you shine. And it, it's a way to show people, not only do you shine, it's a way to show people, I value you. I respect you. I honor you. I honor your time. I think that's probably one of the most important things I learned and I have it to this day. It always stayed with me. If you're on time, you're late. Just be there, show up, be consistent because people are relying on you. I feel guilt as I'm listening to that because I know lately I have not been so good with like being on time to things. I need to though. I need to. I think it's really important and working in the White House, even the president, like he had an itinerary, a schedule and you would see. So there are some protectees, we call them prote protectees that would be late. And then there were some protectees that would be on time. They would be consistent. They wouldn't cancel on you. And I would just see the the vibe or energy that they would get from others. And I would see people, the ones that were on time and consistent, people would gravitate towards them. And the ones that weren't, that were maybe a little bit flaky and not there, I would see that people didn't want to be around them or work with them. It really changes. It's such a, a skill that we don't teach. And I'm thanking mm -hmm. U.S. Secret Service for making me accountable. <laughs> were there any, any other tangible things? I mean, was there a specific training that you went through to become a Secret Service agent? And what do they teach you during that training? So becoming an agent is obviously it's very hard. They say, I think there was a study done and less than, it's easier to get into Harvard than to be an agent, a Secret Service agent. So I think it's something like tens of thousands of applications a year. And so they're, they're very selective on who they pick. So you actually have to go through the hiring process itself, which can take up to a year. They interview you multiple times. You take a written exam to, you know, it's an aptitude test, obviously, like academically and and. and they want to understand how you think. They also, part of the interview where they give you hypothetical scenarios as well to see how you respond. Um, they want to know how you're going to be out there in the field when you're dealing with people because you're dealing with the public. There's a polygraph as well. I actually became the polygraph examiner for the service after I got hired. I did the polygraphs for people who wanted the job. But to be a special agent with the U.S. Secret Service, you have to take a polygraph and pass it. And they're called lifestyle polygraphs. So they look into your background it, to see you know, who you are, what you've done. And the majority of people do embellish or lie on their resumes. And so part of what they do is they want to make sure, one, you're not a liar. And then two, obviously your background, history, criminal, any criminal involvement. And the truth was they were really were looking for transparency and integrity. Mm -hmm. Because often people do make mistakes in life. I mean, again, it had to be within a range. So that was part of the process. But well, after you go through all of that and you get hired, then they give you a conditional offer of, of employment, which means you don't have the job yet, 
But if you go to training and you pass, then maybe we'll still give you the job. So when you pass all of that, then you go to a field office. I was given New York. I was from New York. And then I think also because the word was nobody wanted to go to New York. Everybody loved New York's a very busy city, a very tough city. And um, if you were in New York field office, you worked. It was like the office that you really, really had to hustle and work in. And then they put you out in the field and they see how you perform. And you have to perform. So how did you then end up at the White House? Everybody thinks that if you're a Secret Service agent, you automatically go to the president's detail. You do not. It is actually difficult to get in. The majority of agents do not go to the presidential detail. So you actually have to do about several years in the field, which is what what I did. You do several years in the field. And what you're doing is you're helping supplement the the president's team, but then also former presidents because they get protection for life. First ladies, former first ladies, cabinet members, they get protection. Also in New York City, you have the UN. So foreign heads of state that would visit New York, we give them protection. So they get Secret Service protection because you don't want any foreign head of state getting assassinated on U.S. soil. So they would get Secret Service protection. So you were super busy when it came to the protection space. I mean, I've had so many King of Jordan, UK. I probably maybe protected third of the world's leaders, like all these different countries that come in and you work with their team. So you work a lot on the international side of things, not just when they come here, but then when you go over there. And then, and you were criminal cases. So a lot of people don't know that the U.S. Secret Service was a dual mission agency. You do protection, and then you also work cases. So I had my own caseload and and did that stuff. And then from time to time, I would do undercover. I get pulled for it because I I didn't look like an agent. So they just kind of throw me in there. (laughs) And I was, it was, it was great. Wigs and everything? No wigs, because you can see wigs. I didn't need the wigs. I, I was myself, but I would go in and I would be able, because I didn't look like law enforcement, I could go in and do things that the typical agents couldn't do. Remember once there was someone, it wasn't even my case, he was selling passports, documents, this, this, and I think he was tied into an, uh, a mafia ring, an Albanian mafia ring, if I remember correctly. He was selling passports and documents to people, and those people included terrorists who were trying to get into the U.S. to take out a tax here in the U.S. And this was after 9-11. So they were trying to get him. He was very good. Nobody could get him. So the idea was to send me in to see if I could get documents. So I pretended to be a sex trafficked, uh, um, part of a sex trafficking ring, a a worker that was brought to the U.S., which they do. And what they do is when you're a sex uh, worker, they, they, they trick you, they bring you into the country, and then they take all your documentation from you, your passport and all that. And they tell you, you have to work off your debt. And then they'll give you your passport and your IDs back and you're free to go live your life. So I pretended to be one of those women. And I started buying passports, documents from him and to accumulate those so that we had enough to prosecute him, to get him, because he was really good at not getting caught. And you got him. We got him. Yes. Wow. You were out on the field. You were doing undercover. But eventually, I, if I read this correctly, you worked for President Obama. You worked for... Clinton. Yeah. So the way it works is you protect all the protectees you help out the first several several years. So that's when I had um, President Bush, President Clinton. And then when they became formers, you still have them, former uh, President Ford and all that, all those folks. You, you protect everybody. But you're in a supplemental capacity. Then your time comes where you go to the president's detail. And this is you eat, le- live, breathe president. He go, You go where he goes and that's it. And so at that point, uh, President Barack Obama was in office and I was assigned to him. I actually, where it worked, I went first, I did White House perimeter security, and that's for protecting the White House grounds. We would always have people who would leave packages or test us um, or any attacks at the White House. And then from there, I went to Mrs. Obama and I had her. And then from her, I went to him and I had him. So it's an escalation. But to get that, you have to go through a whole other internal training academy. So it's not, hey, I'd like to do it. It's you have to try out for it. You have to go through the academy. It's an internal selection process. And then if you pass that, then you can go. So majority of agents never go to the president's detail. Was there something that struck you about all of these presidents that you did have the honor to work with? They're people. They're, they're people and they all have humor and they're all, you know, 
who they are. Did you ever feel like you got to see weakness in them? Because I know, obviously, in front of the camera, they have to put on this strong face. They don't get to be vulnerable. They don't get to be humans, really. Did you ever feel like you got to see the more vulnerable human side? You do. You do see their vulnerability. I, I, don't, I wouldn't use the word weakness, though, because I feel that to be... To get to that place, whoever it is, whatever your affiliation is, whatever party, whether you like someone or dislike, to become president of the United States, that is no easy feat. It's not an easy thing to obtain. So, yes, you would see their vulnerability but because they're human. They're not this thing. But their vulnerabilities were, I don't want to, they were beautiful. You would see them connect with people. You could see them connect with their families or their dogs or their pets or very simple things. For example, President George Bush. I would go to the ranch and you would see him go from being the president of the United States to us, you know, him clearing trails on the ranch. I'm from New York City. I was like, where are we going? What are we <laughs> clearing? It's like, you know, so those, those were amazing moments. But you're around history. I've also heard you say that President Bush wrote little note cards. Is that right? That was his father. Oh. George Bush Sr., what he used to do is he would write hand note cards to people and thank them which I love. And I, I still try to do it to this day. I, I totally stole it, stole it from former President Bush. It touched people so much because today, especially in, in the world of email and text, to meet someone and then later on receive a card saying, thank you for your time. Thank you for this. It, it leaves an impression. But I thought it was brilliant. That is. I was invited to the White House and I met with the president and the first lady. I saw. Yeah. And it was kind of a crazy experience just realizing that you see these people on TV, but they really are humans and they, I don't know. I, I don't know how to describe it. I think I was a bit, I was in shock, honestly, by the whole thing. It was just, it felt like a blur, but yeah, it was very cool. Did you have a moment when you were walking in thinking, I'm walking into the White House? Definitely, for sure. My, when I graduated from law school, my friend was working in the White House at the time and gave me three tickets to go to the White House and do the tour that you do. And at the time, my grandma and grandpa had come from Japan to my graduation and they really wanted to go to the White House and my mom wanted to go. So ultimately, I gave them the three tickets and I was like, don't worry about it. Maybe one day I'll go to the White House. And um, my grandfather passed away. And that's why he's one of the main reasons I quit being just a corporate lawyer and tried to come on social media and help people. And obviously that led to the White House invitation. So it seemed it was very full circle for me. And it felt it was just an honor to be in that same place that my grandfather got a picture in the White House. I got to stand there and take a picture. And it was, yeah, it was very emotional, very special. You were invited. Yeah. What did you learn in your time as a Secret Service agent that you think we as everyday people could apply to our lives, whether it be about body language or communication or the way we present ourselves? I will tell people that how you are is not how you have to stay. We are evolving. And so some people will think I was born this way. You can mold and shift yourself to be whatever you want to be with skills, with training. I didn't have these skills. I, I grew up in Queens. I didn't have the knowledge, the education. I mean, I went to school and I went to college, but there were so many things I didn't know. You can shape and mold yourself into whatever you want to have. And you should always look to excel. I have this saying, if you think you know everything, the day you think you know everything is the day you become obsolete. You must be this evolving thing. And so that's one really important thing that you need to add. And even though you go through the academy, you still have training and more training and more training. So you should look at yourself that way. How can I continue to add to myself? And then human connection is really important. There's so much out there like master this and use this strategy and use this, use this skill when it comes to your work or, or whatever you're doing, doing. I will tell you this. You need to learn people. You, to lead people, you must understand them. If you can master people, you can master anything. Because at the end of the day, I don't care what line of work you're in, you are dealing with human beings. And so people are the important thing that you need to focus on. And sometimes we don't look at that. We don't honor and respect each other. We're very quick to judge. And another thing the Secret Service taught me is to be very open-minded, especially when I did polygraphs or interviews. I would sit across people who did some really terrible things. I learned not to say this person is a bad person. 
I would I learned to say their behavior is bad or what they did was bad and not to define people based on one thing that they did in their life. People are so complex and so involved. So what we like to do is we like to simplify people, put them in a box and label them. Not only does it cause them harm, if you put, even put that aside, it makes it harder for us to, to learn people. I look at people as a challenge. So if I have a difficult person or a high conflict person, I don't think, oh my goodness, poor me. I think, how am I going to move around this person? How am I going to get them to here or there if I have to? And then some people, you know, you read them really well and you should learn to read people to determine also who should be in your life. Often people come to me and I'll, I'll work with people or they'll ask for guidance and I'll consult with people and they'll say, you know, I have all these people that come at me and I'm very either I'm an empath or I'm, I, I deal with so much and I have all these problems and all these people. And I hear this. These people are not the problem. You're the problem because you're 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 Grand Central Station. Everybody can come visit. You have to learn to who who should have access in your life. Not everybody should have access to you. And that was a really important thing. And actually, I would say that I learned that in the NYPD because when I first got hired with the NYPD, which is where I started off first, right out of college, I remember one of the first lectures I heard was, you better do uh, a thoughtful assessment of who your friends are because a lot of the friends you have, you probably can't keep and you have this job. And I never thought about that. Then I looked around and I started assessing the world, my friends and the people around me. And I was like, Ooh, that person does some shady stuff. Maybe I shouldn't be around that. Oh, maybe I shouldn't be around this. And that's when I learned also to determine what is right and what is wrong. What is good behavior? What is bad behavior? What is hurtful and what is harmful? So these jobs just, they weren't jobs. They were they shape me into the person that I am and the person I still continue to try to be. The point you made about assessing your friend circle, I think is so important because I feel like a lot of us keep people around just because it's familiar when it may not necessarily be the best thing for you. So when you are looking at your friend circle and assessing whether they should be in there or not, what are you looking for? Are you looking at how they behave, how they make you feel? What should you be looking at? There are a couple of things. First thing is, how do they treat you? How do you feel after you're done spending time with your friends? Do you need a nap when you're done? Because if you need a nap when you're done, it means you've got people that are taking from you. Relationships, healthy relationships, you should think of them like playing tennis. They hit the ball, you hit the ball. They hit the ball, you hit the ball. But if you're in a relationship where you're just hitting the ball and you're just give, 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 giving, that's not healthy. Or just for yourself to make sure that you're not being a burden on other people. Because sometimes we're so used to taking and from others who support us and are our rocks and there for us that we don't realize I'm not giving back to this person. So that's one thing to look at. Is it a balanced relationship? They give, you give, they give, you give. The other thing you want to look at, and I'm so glad you said this, we get used to people. We think because somebody has been in our life for a really long time, they should stay. Oh, but I've had this friend since I was in eighth grade. And who that person was then changes over time. And that relationship changes so you also don't want to keep people around just because they've always been around because I've known them since eighth grade. And I've had people come to me say, you know, I have this friend. I've known them since I was so young, but I, I don't like the way they treat me. I don't like this. And I ask them, why are they still in your universe? The people that have access to you, you should consistently over time look around and assess them, reassess them. There's people that I knew, wonderful people, but for whatever reason, they had to evolve out of my life. Or sometimes those relationships change. Those people change. They shift. Their priorities shift. Doesn't mean people are bad, but who has access to you is important because it either elevates you or suppresses you as an individual. So if I have people who are always taking from me, how is that making me better? How do, where do I have the energy then to live my life if I'm give, 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 giving? I end up feeling empty. One of the most profound things that I heard you say on a podcast before was, a lot of times when you come to people about these big life decisions, if they tell you no or you can't do it, what they're really doing is projecting their fears onto you. And I thought that was just so profound because I remember when I quit my law firm, one of the law firm partners who was my boss told me, like, you're going to regret this. You're never going to find success. Like, if you want, take away your two weeks notice. I'll pretend we never saw it. I love that you just said that because what he did is project onto you how he thinks. Not only did he do, do that, it's also you just told him by quitting that there's something better for me out there. Do you think he wants to know there's something better out there? No, because he's staying in that job. So you have to fail. 
he has to feel that way because then that means there's nothing better out there for him either. He's thinking, hey, I hit the pinnacle. There's nothing better. You're saying, oh, no, no, no. There is something better. He doesn't want to hear that because what you're doing is you're telling him your life's, mm. that's what that was. Yes. But it's tough because at the time, it's not like I felt confidently like there was something better. I felt like there was the possibility that I could have more of an impact. I could be doing something better with my life. So I also wasn't sure of myself at that time. How do you find confidence in your decisions, especially when people are saying you're not making the right decision? One, I'm very careful who I ask for advice now. I don't ask for it. I, I have two questions and I, I hope everybody uses them. Before you listen to anybody's advice, whether it's solicited or unsolicited, you should say to yourself, who is this person? Why should I listen to them? So who is this person? What experience or knowledge do they have to be giving you advice? Right? Who are you? And also, who are you in my life? Is it just another attorney I'm working for? It's like, eh, okay. Is it a family member? All right, fine. But then what expertise does my family member or friend have to give me this advice? It's like, are they, are they qualified to give you the advice they are giving you? If they are not, but you also have to trust yourself. I have people come to me and say, you know, I'm thinking about getting a divorce. Should I get a divorce? And I stop people right there and I say, that is such a personal and intimate decision to make. You're the one who has to roll over every morning and look at your partner. And you're asking other people what you should do. And this is where I think we have a lack of trust in ourselves. We have to learn to trust our own judgment. It's okay to be unsure. Every choice I've ever made, I've never been 100% confident, but I trusted in myself. And I was okay with making a mistake. Nobody wants to make a mistake anymore. It's your mistake. I'd rather make the mistake and be, it be mine and be on it. And you know, you never, there's a difference too between failing in life and being a failure. When you're failing, you fail. You fail a test. You, it's a temporary thing. I failed at this. I didn't launch this right. I didn't do this right. It's, it's a temporary thing. But when you're a failure, it's permanent. You're never a failure. Not until it's done. Till that day that you transition or you go wherever you're going to go and your life is done here, that's when you become a failure. The moment you're like, I'm done, that's when it truly ends. We have to change that mindset and that vocabulary that we have. And it's also our responsibility not to listen to everybody. You can't blame other people. Well, this person, this, this person, that. Yes, but you're choosing to listen and you're choosing to absorb what they say. You have to ask yourself why. I feel like it's because I can speak for myself too. It, it is nice to have someone validate what you're thinking might be the next best move. Or... Yes. But if we live our lives looking for validation, how painful is that? Because I'm only relevant or my thoughts or my choices are only only means something if you say it's okay. So I have to wait for you to give me what I need for me to be okay. And that's really hard. I want to share this story. I went, I did my first book, Becoming Bulletproof with Idea Architects in my literary agency, who I love. They're amazing. And they had this um, group think tank weekend event they were going to do, and they were going to bring their top authors. And I was very fortunate because they invited me. They said, we'd love for you to come. I said, who, me? <laughs> I'm your bulletproof, you know, secret service person. They had like really big thinkers. They said, no, we'd love for you to come and attend. So I fly out to California. I'm in this big conference area and it's all their top authors and they're, 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 they're people there. And I love them because their brand was we want to make books that make the world a better, wiser, more just place. And that's kind of always been my vibe. So I sit down at this table. I'm saying hello to everyone. I sit down. I look over to my right and I say, hi, my name is Evie. Nice to meet you. And the man next to me says, hi, I'm Mark. Nice to meet you too. And I ask him, Mark, you know what? You know, what do you do? Are you an author? Or do you work with Idea Architects? He said, oh, no, I'm an author. I have a book coming out. And I said, oh, what's the title of, of your book? And at the time, and I, I'm definitely butchering it, but at the time, the title was My Stupid Idea. And I said, that's the title of your book? He's like, yeah. <laughs> I said, what was your stupid idea? And he said, I'm the founder of Netflix. <laughs> and I asked him, why is your book titled that? He said, because when I had the idea for Netflix and I went around talking to people, everybody told me it was the dumbest thing they ever heard of. Nobody wanted to invest in it. Nobody thought it was a good idea. I didn't listen. Think if he needed validation for what he would have done. I love that. I think the one thing that did give me confidence, by far the biggest decision I've made up until now, the scariest one was leaving this job as a traditional corporate lawyer where I had this cushy salary to and just to completely walk away from that. 
I remember the guiding metric that I decided at the end was like, I fear regret way more than I fear failure. It can be really scary, the thought of like, oh, I could fail. And to me, failure would have meant like having to go back to a law firm because I did not make enough money to put a roof over my head. But I just I feared regret. I don't want to walk. I don't want 10 years to pass and me ever look back and say, I regret not doing this. I regret not spending time with this person or not trying to do this thing. Regret is, to me, the scariest thing in life. And I've I think it's because I felt regret, like I've regretted not spending time with people who I lost. Right. I feel that that's like the most important, like that's been a guiding light for me, because if I don't do this and there's been times in my life, those little choices where you listen to someone else and you feel like, man, why did I listen to them? I should have done my thing. And even let's say hypothetically, even though you left and you're crushing it, you're crushing it completely and you're doing it in such a different way, which is so wonderful. So you're out there, you're crushing it. But let's say hypothetically, let's live in it didn't work out land and it didn't work out and you had to go back to being a lawyer. So what? So what? Who's keeping score? Yeah. I think having this like, who cares? So what? Like there are moments where when I have that and I think to myself, so what? So what? I bomb this. Especially now in TV, I put in an audition for different parts because I do hosting. I do this. I can't tell you how many times I hear no. But if I sat there and I, and I absorbed every time I was rejected for an opportunity or a part or something, I would, I would evaporate. I think we really have to be connected to ourselves and trust ourselves and honor ourselves enough and also give ourselves the grace to make bad choices. Don't be perfect. What about for situations like you're going to interview for a job? I know a lot of my audience wants to know this. How can you exude the confidence you need to get that job? Oh, my God. I love this question. Only because I was the, I was on the HR side of the U.S. Secret Service. I did the polygraphs for the hiring that we did. So the applicants had to go through me. I was the last line of defense, they would call it. But what I've learned, too, and even myself, because when I left the service and I still to this day, I'm in, being interviewed all the time. And then on the flip side, I interview people for work or for different things. Let's break it down into parts. I think it's easier. First is body language. The majority of what we communicate to the world is with our bodies. So I want you to focus first on your body. How do you enter the room? Shoulders back. I know, right? Even <laughs> she just fixed it. It's, you know, when I do the news, sometimes on commercial break, my, my husband will text me. He's like, sit up, you're slouching again. <laughs> you know, how's America going to listen to anything you say? I have to look confident. So own your body, sit up, shoulders back, take up space, take up space. Because when you're so small in this, it means I'm not worthy. I shouldn't be here. You're more powerful than I am. You can have humility without diminishing yourself. So take up space. Sit down, take up space. Show it through your body. Enter the room. When they offer you something to eat or drink, you know how sometimes you do that? Just you're always fine. I wouldn't take anything because it really does put them out of way to get you something. I would just decline it. I make sure, unless you really need water because you're thirsty or something. I would just decline it. Let the process begin because these they're busy. Yeah, you declined my water initially. <laughs> yes, but it, then, but, but I asked you to fill it up later. Because, you know what? I don't want to put you out. You're busy. You have people coming through. So I wanted to honor your time. Now, you've got body language down. Then I want you to think about your verbal economics. I want you to think about your paralinguistics. Paralinguistics is what we sound like when we speak, okay? Our tone, our pitch, the rate of speech, rate of speech. When we go too fast because we try to say stuff and I have to catch myself because there's so much sometimes I want to say or I have to literally tell myself, slow down, pull back, pull back. When you slow down, you make less mistakes. You're able to think through what you're going to say and you sound more confident. And then try to find the deepest tone that you have, your deepest tone, not a manufacturing of fake deep tone, but your true deep tone. Our voices over time they carry all of our experiences and sometimes negative. So we may, we, the way we make our bodies small, we can make our voices really small and soft and we close in. And that's not your real voice. It's not your powerful voice. Find your powerful voice, your deeper voice, the voice that comes from within your belly. Own it. That's the second most influential thing. The last thing people see, and the, the research actually shows us that 7% of what we say uh, what we say, only 7% is what people actually hear. So it's first body language. It's about 50 something percent. Our paralinguistics is about 30 something percent. And then what we actually practice and rehearse to say, which is what you're worried about, 
only 7% of that gets absorbed. Nobody's even listening half the time. It is not what you say, but how people feel. Do they feel you? Do they feel your presence, your words, your energy, your vibration? That's what you want to bring. Wow. Is it true that we should get the interviewers to talk more? Because I remember when I was going through interviews for law firms, I had this one interview. I thought it went terribly because all we did was talk about her ballet experience. The attorney at the law firm was like in ballet. I did ballet. So we just talked about her ballet. And then I got a call back to go to their New York office. (laughs) So that is truly brilliant. What happened there is she ended up talking about herself, which the number one way to make people feel good about themselves selves or a conversation is let them do the majority of the talking because le- people love to talk about themselves, which she did. And that was a connection. That was rapport. So if you can ask questions where they can engage organically, do you want it to be organic? Because if they feel like you're interviewing them, then it's not going to go well. But what happened is in your situation, it was organic. She got to speak about herself, about ballet, something she obviously loved, and it made her feel good. Without you knowing, you primed her to feel good throughout that interview because she talked about something she loved, ballet. That's why it went well. It wasn't what you said. It's how she felt being around you. Interesting. Yes. What about if you are, let's do another scenario. If you are going in to ask your boss for a raise, is there something specific you would do there? Yes. Yes, yes. I get asked this all the time. Please, please don't say, I think it's time to get a raise. I believe I work really hard. I feel that it's been time. I've been here for a year. None of that works. What you should do is you just need to make a list of everything you've done on that job, everything you've crushed. So I've made X amount of dollars this year. I closed X amount of deals. I've done X amount of interviews. I've done this. You go in with a list of facts and write them down. Don't try to memorize them. Write them down because when you're walking in, he or she's going to be like, oh, wow, they mean business. They really want this raise. And they're about to tell me that they did. You come off as professional. You're going to say, sir, ma'am, or however you refer to your boss, you're going to say, I want to speak to you about my time here. I love my experience here. I appreciate being here. I want to talk to you about raising my compensation. I want to share with you some of the things that I've done over the past year and a half, two years, however long you've been in there and read them off. I've I've made the company this amount of money. I've yielded this. I closed this deal. I did that. And so you want it to be a balance of, I appreciate you and I appreciate my space here. And I, I want to continue to serve you. And at the same time, balance, right? Tennis. We're playing tennis. At the same time, it's, let me sh- tell you everything I've done because I'm giving you facts. Because you can't dispute facts. But when you go in and say, I feel like it's time to get a raise. I can dispute that. Well, I don't feel like it's time for you to get a raise. <laughs> Do you see? Yeah. Oh, I believe my work shows itself. Instead of telling them, show them. Let me show you what I've done. That's how you get that raise. Then it's not emotional. It's just factual. Yes. Ba-ba. I've worked. I've crushed it. I've done this. I've done this. I've done this. And then it also internally, it helps you. It gives you the confidence because as you write this stuff down, something powerful happens when we put pen to paper. You're reading this and you're thinking, this is me. I did all of this. Yes, I should get this raise. That's how you get the raise. No, no, think, I believe, no, feel, please get rid of that language. It does not serve you. That's how you don't get the raise. What other, what other language should we be avoiding? Because I've noticed that's a theme of what you're teaching me is just the, how important language and the words we're using to ourselves and outwardly are. Slow down and think about the words you use. I learned this actually when I began doing criminal interviews in the U.S. Secret Service. And I learned that there were certain words that would cause people to either shut down or open up. So, for example, if I had a criminal case and it was theft, somebody stole money, which would happen a lot. I wouldn't say to that person, did you steal that money? What can I say instead? Erica, I'm going to put you on the spot. Instead of saying, did you take this money? What could I say instead that might not sound so harsh? Did you reallocate this money? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I love it. True lawyer, true lawyer. You could say something like, I do love it. Actually, I never even thought of that. Did you reallocate? Did you move this money around? <laughs> you could say, did you take this money? So that steal word is the one that's you need to eliminate. Yes. How about this? If you say to somebody, if I say to you, Eric, and it's not true. Erica, you're lying to me. How does that feel? Not good. Erica, are you being truthful? How about... I feel that you're not sharing everything. I feel that you're holding on to some information still. You know, why don't you talk to me? Erica, is there anything else you would want to add? 
Yes. But I also don't want to. Here's the thing. You want to be able to call people out too sometimes. I don't want us to be too soft because we need to deal with people. It's not about having conflict. We're in a society where we don't want to upset or ruffle feathers. No, you need to, you, you need to deal with people. Don't completely shut down because you don't want conflict. That's a horrible way to live. And in fact, that actually causes you more stress in life because you're suppressing, suppressing, su- suppressing, holding things in. And now you're under chronic stress. Mm-hmm. Instead of dealing with that moment, that stressful moment where you need to address somebody. And you know what? When you start to address people, that builds confidence. Confrontation, if done well, can be healthy and okay. It's okay to debate things as a lawyer. It doesn't have to get ugly. So it's all right to push back. So in that scenario, instead of saying to somebody, hey, you're lying to me, you're not telling me you're, 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 a, you're a liar because it's ugly. Nobody wants to be a liar. I would say, look, it feels like you're not telling me everything. It feels like you're not holding everything. You're holding on to some information. I really want you to tell me the truth. I'm not here to judge you. There's other ways to get people to listen information. That's how I learned language matters because it impacts people, either opens them up or shuts them down. So when you think about how you talk to people, I want you to think of your language in, in terms of verbal economics. What words am I using and how are they going to fall on someone? If you're looking to crush somebody, let it all go. But understand that when it's done, whatever you put out there stays there and it impacts the relationship. And you might say, you know what? It's okay. I wanted to give this person a piece of my mind and I'm glad I did. I'm fine with that. As <laughs> long as it's, and I've had that happen where I'm like, oh, no, no, I'm going to unleash, but I choose. I make that choice. As long as you choose to make it at and you're good with living with the outcome, then I'm fine with it. Mm. But when you're emotional, it's the best time to not speak. And when we're emotional, we say the wrong things. But with your words, I want you to think about who am I speaking to? How are my words going to impact them? Will my words shut them down or get them to open up? That's, that's how we need to think about how we speak to people. What are you doing before you have entered the difficult part of the conversation, whether it's you're asking for a business negotiation to happen or, or you're asking them if they're lying, what do you do before then to build rapport so that they, they trust you enough to be able to open up to you? That's great. I love that you said that rapport, which is literally what they teach to the best negotiators in Homeland Security and in, in, in this world. Everybody thinks they know what rapport is and they don't. Everybody thinks rapport is, hey, how are you? How's your cat? How do you like New York? That is not rapport. Everybody thinks rapport is what you do in the beginning of a conversation. It is not. Rapport is beginning, middle, and end. Side note, we're having great rapport. We had it from the beginning. It stayed, and we have it all the way through. This is rapport. Rapport is a mutual understanding and agreement about the conversation. We're having that. We're riding the same wave the whole way through. That's rapport. I get her. She gets me. That's rapport. How do you do it? Great eye contact. Look at people when you talk to them and also look at them when they talk to you. It says, I'm here, I see you, I feel you. No phones. Where are phones, Erica? Go. Not here <laughs> because we're present. I value you, you value me. I'm fully here. That's another thing you can do. Then also when you're speaking, I know we're doing a podcast, but be aligned with people, frontally aligned. That's right. Open up. <laughs> frontally aligned. When you're open and neither of us have done this closed off, it sends the message, I'm open, I'm here, I'm welcoming. Have your hands out. Have your hands on the table. If you're doing a business meeting, keep your hands out. Let people see them. These are very simple ways in which you build connection and rapport. And a side note to any lawyers out there or business people, if you're doing a negotiation with someone and you're working on them and you're talking to them and you get them in this great space and now you take them and you sit down at a table to do paperwork, the table kills it. Mm. I want people to learn not to have a table, to have open space between them. Because the minute you put somebody in front of a table, it makes it formal now. So you spend all this work or time rather working on someone, softening them up, softening them up, getting them to feel comfortable. And now you just put them in front of a table to do paperwork. What do they do? Oh, I better sit up straight. I'm going to sit up. And now all that effort and energy you put in. Yeah, it does feel distant when you put the table in in between. When we did interviews, first thing I was taught, interviewing, interrogation 101, nope. Table. So you're on the same side of the table with them? There is no table. My table was when when I would travel the country, I would travel the country and I would help local police departments with their very difficult cases. They would call me in and say, Hey, we have this case. This person's going to walk. We have no proof. Can you talk to them? We interviewed them multiple times. We're getting nothing. So I would come in and I would look for where I would do the interview. So I would literally, they probably thought I was nuts. I would go through the whole police station, wherever I was, 
and I would find the perfect room. And then if they had a table, I would take the table and I would rearrange all their furniture. They thought I was out of my <laughs> mind. And I would push the table to the side. No table at all. If I needed to write on something, then I'd push the table to the side and I'd write with my right hand. But I always wanted open space. A table is a barrier. It blocks you off. You're creating it's me versus you. No, I want open space. I want our energy to flow. I want a connection. You know, the point about the table, though, that's interesting, too. Even when you're going in to ask for a raise, there's always that kind of implicit power dynamic. If your boss is at their desk behind their desk and you're in front of it asking for a raise, maybe you have to say, hey, can we have this conversation out doing coffee or something? Oh, that's a tricky one. I wouldn't want to pull my boss out from behind the desk. Okay. You like them behind there? No, I don't. What they're doing. So it's a power dynamic. When you want to put people in their place, you want to discipline them. Having a desk between you or a table is great. Hey, sit down. We, I'd like to talk to you. It's like, oh, so that's great <laughs> because it creates that power dynamic. So for your boss, it's good because it's the me and then there's you. I'm the boss and then you're over there. Now for you, it's rough. If you can overcome that and it's also it's a barrier for your boss. Don't think they're shielding themselves from you because they don't maybe they don't want to give you the raise. So they're using the desk as a buffer to shield themselves. You'll know confident people. Like, for example, when you go out there and start paying attention to when you go to events and people are speaking, some people will stand behind a podium and they will hold on to that thing for dear life. It's a shield to protect themselves. So bosses do that too. It's me and then there's you. You sit over there. Now, could you ask your boss to go out to speak? You could. It depends on the relationship you have with your boss. Some people may not have that. But it's also go in there. Some offices have like chairs like this from side to side. And you can tell your boss, hey, I'd just love to sit down and chat with you. But to tell your boss, hey, let's go here. Not that's good. a little, <laughs> probably not the best thing. But just be aware, if you understand the dynamics, that you're going to be at a slight disadvantage. I will tell you this. If you can, make sure your seat isn't low to the ground. So another thing I would do when I would go to meetings, I would pick the seat that was, had the highest um, elevation. Or I would make sure my seat, you know, could lift up. And when I would interview people, I would also make sure that my seat was slightly higher than theirs. So there was a little bit of a, they're looking up at me and I'm slightly looking down to them. <laughs> There's little ways you can create power dynamics, but you want to be very subtle in the way you do it. Because once people see that, then it becomes disingenuous. And at the end of the day, being genuine and being authentic is what really matters. It's an ethos. They're not even strategies. It's an ethos. Another Greek word, mm. which is, a way of being. And if you manifest this way of being, people will feel you. They will feel a connection to you. They will want to give you a raise. They will want to hire you for the job. They will want to date you. They will want to marry you. They will want to be around you because they think, I want to be around this person. I want to work with this person. I like this person. Like your ballet slipper. I think so much of what you've been saying today, I'm thinking about how I can improve myself. The little things from like I, I knew from watching many podcasts that you've done that I need to have better posture. This oh, is why yeah. <laughs> consciously this whole interview, I've been like hurting my back trying to, <laughs> trying to point it up. But I think also a lot of what you're saying can be applied to relationships too. And I was thinking about my, my own relationship with my husband and how one point you made was don't speak so much when you're emotional. It It is hard because when you're in the middle of an argument, you want to do it when you're emotionally charged. But really the best thing it seems like you're saying to do is walk away, analyze how you're feeling about it, and then go in with a more logical approach. So that is hard because, I, as I mentioned, I'm a fight person. So I want to be, you're the, you're the lawyer. <laughs> so you want to, let me tell you how wrong you are. Yep. Is that the solution? Is you proving to somebody how right you are and how wrong they are the ultimate goal? It is not. It's about having a better, healthier relationship. So sometimes our ego gets in the way and what we're focused on is, I need to show you how right I am. Sometimes, I'm not saying that's not a good thing. Sometimes it's okay if we're trying to, to share a point. But I do agree with him. If you're emotional, shut the up. <laughs> that's like I tell myself. And I leave. So I'm married and I, as great as my husband is, and we're both interrogators and interviewers. We have the same skills. And the emotion comes because it's a certain relationship. There are times where I look at him, I'm like, I'm about to go bad. I'm going to leave. Or I will just take the keys and I will leave. I will drive. I will blast the radio. And then I will go back when I can speak more intelligently because words do matter. And I can say things that are hurtful. He can say things that are hurtful. These things are going to happen. 
I just want to say that they will happen. But if you value the person in your life, especially in a, a relationship like that, you're also there to elevate that person, not make them feel like garbage every mm-hmm. time you fight. And so the way they make you feel bad, you don't want to do that to them. But at the same time, you also have to be, have awareness too. Not all people are good for us too. So if you're in an unhealthy relationship, you also have to recognize that too. How can you tell if you're in a harmful relationship that you need to get out of versus maybe if you're just going through a rough patch or maybe you've had a miscommunication? Like, where is that line? Well, I will say this. If you're questioning whether you're in a harmful relationship or not, you already have your answer. I remember one friend came to me and she wanted to, she suspected her husband of infidelity and they were having issues. She said, I want to polygraph my husband. I said, you want to polygraph him? She's like, I want to know if he's cheating. I said, so you think polygraphing him is going to help you figure that out? She said, yes. She's like, I need to know what to do. And I told her, I said, you already know what to do. The fact that you want to polygraph him tells you that you know he's doing this. And after talking to her for a bit more, she revealed that he had cheated on her in the past. So I said, you already know that I'm not hooking you up with a private polygrapher so you can, you know what to do. She was so focused on catching him, being, ha-ha, you lied to me again. And I said to her, you're focusing on the wrong thing. And you need to decide within yourself if you want to stay in this marriage or not. Your polygraph isn't going to fix this for you. Most people know when they are not in a good relationship. The lines are within you as far as what you are willing to take or not. Some people might say, I would never stand for that in a relationship. Or other people might say, I'm okay with that. It's a personal thing. But it's not healthy when you're not healthy as a result of it. I think that would be the best barometer. And if you are around someone who makes you feel like you're worthless, that's no good. And if it's, I guess I can say a good relationship is respect, is friendship, it's honoring the other person. Do they listen to you? And do they try to be better? Not do they, not do they say they're going to be better, but do, are they actively making changes to be better? If you look at someone and you're thinking, if they would just change this, accept people as they are. And if you accept them as they are, can you stay? And then sometimes we enter relationships and they're great at first. And then people change and they shift and then they move apart. And sometimes it doesn't mean that person's a bad person or it means there's sometimes people didn't do anything wrong in the relationships. Just sometimes they're, I need to move on. And that's okay too. It's such a personal thing. It's a very loaded question. Mm-hmm. And I think usually when people come to me, because people come to me a lot, I really get into the weeds of it. And I ask them, what, are you, what is going on? And it can be, this person treats me this way and I don't like the way they treat me. And I've asked them that. And I've told them my boundaries. And I think maybe this is really important for people know, to, to know. Stop telling everybody your boundaries. They don't care. Stop telling them. Show people your boundaries. So if you tell somebody, hey, you can't talk to me like that, and yet they continue to talk to you like that, and you keep repeating, but you can't talk to me like that. I'm telling you my boundaries. You're crossing my boundaries. Those are not boundaries. Boundaries are not things we verbalize. Boundaries are things we show. So if you tell somebody, hey, if you do that again, I'm not going to speak to you, or we're going to break up, or I'm going to leave the relationship, and you say, that's not a boundary. That's just you talking. We show people how to treat us. We show people our boundaries. I had somebody, actually this was a friend, and her boss would call her all the time. She would say, I keep telling him to not call me past 8 p.m. at night, but he still calls me, and he calls me on the weekends. And she said, he says he won't do it, but he keeps doing it. She had like a, a pretty decent relationship with her boss. And I said, is he listening to you? She said, no. I said, do you answer the phone when he calls you past 8 p.m.? She said, yes. Stop answering the phone. You can't say, don't do this. This is a problem when we tell people these are our boundaries and I need you to respect them. They're going to do what they're used to doing. And until you do something to show them I'm not okay with this, they will keep doing it. How do you decide how many chances you want to give someone? I mean, I know you're talking about making sure that they're showing that they're changing. Do you think that people can change? And if so, like how many chances do we need to give them to understand? People don't change. People change because they want to. People change because they think that something is wrong with them. If they cannot see, hey, you are right, I need to do this, then they won't change. If they're just saying it for you, and we all know if they just say it to say it. But if you're with someone who has a pattern and this is what they are, 
You have to live in the truth of things. It's not about being, I don't believe in being pessimistic or optimistic. Just live in reality. What is the truth? And don't lie to yourself. Usually we're the ones who lie to ourselves, not even the other person. And we make excuses for their behavior. And I've seen it. Oh, he just meant this. Oh, she just meant that. Can you look at the behavior? If you can take the behavior of someone and separate it from who they are, their identity. So let's say it's your sister. Okay, I have this sister. I love my sister, but she's very narcissistic towards me. She's mean. She's a bully. If you pretend it's not your sister for a moment and somebody else is behaving this way toward you, how do you feel about that? Look at the behavior, not the person. Label the behavior, not the person. When you identify the behavior, then you can identify, this is what I'm dealing with. This is why, Erica, when somebody comes to you and they say, hey, I've got this issue, I've got this relationship, and they ask you for advice, is it not very clear to you sometimes what people need to do? Yeah. And do they do it usually? No. no. Because they're so emotionally tied to the person. That's why it gets hard. If you can say to yourself, if somebody came to me and told me that this person, this was their boyfriend or their girlfriend or their significant other, and they were treating the, the, them this way, like, what advice would I give? Like, how would I tell them to, to deal with it? So with, if you go back to my example with the woman who came to me who was a friend with the polygraph, and she's like, her husband had cheated on her in the past. She suspected him of doing it again. I told her, you know your answer. And she decided to stay, which is fine. But if you're going to stay and go nuts, then that's not fine. If you're going to stay and say, look, I know what he is. I accept it and I'm going to stay because I've got kids, because I've got that. That's a personal choice. I, I give no judgment. What people decide is really their personal choice, but then make peace with it. If you're not going to make peace with it, pick up your toys, pack up your shit, and move on. I know a lot of people will say what they think they want you to hear. So to appease you, they'll say, I won't do it again, or I've changed. You've done so many polygraph tests, like these lie detector tests. How do you spot a liar? Don't listen to what people say. Look at what they do. There's this ancient Greek saying, don't listen to your enemy. Look at them. It will tell you everything. Don't listen to what people say. People do a lot of this, but they don't do. I'm a person who judges people on behavior. So my example of the friend that I told you that I pulled back from, verbally, this friend was like, I love you. You're amazing. I do anything for you. But this friend's actions were not that. So you have to see, is what they say in harmony with what they do? Is what they say in harmony with their behavior? And if it, if it, it is not in harmony, you have your answer. If what they say to you is how they actually treat you, then you have your answer. These are the two things. When we listen to people, it confuses us. Mm -hmm. It's noise sometimes. Don't listen. Look, watch. What do they do? Are they saying or are they doing? Because if it's, yes, yes, I'll be there for you. I'll be there for you. I'll do this for you. I'm sorry I missed that. I'm sorry this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They're showing you how they, they're just showing you. So you either have to be okay with them as they are or walk away. People do not change because you want them to change. They have to look at themselves and say, I want to change and I will change. And not saying it. That's how you decide. Is there something, though, in that moment that I can say, oh, their eyes are looking dodgy or their voice, there is something happened with their voice? Okay. You're looking for detecting deception, which I feel like yeah, is a whole like other podcast, lawyer, Erica. The lawyer want to be detected. <laughs> yes. Yes. So reading people is super important. I will say this. Can people's eye movement shift? Yes. But just because somebody breaks eye contact with you doesn't make them a liar. There's a lot of stuff out there. And I don't like it because it's very misleading to people. It says if somebody looks up and to the right, then it means this. It's nonsense because we're so different, so unique. Think of it. We all have our own DNA, our background, our genetic makeup, our parents, how we were raised, whether we had parents or didn't have parents, the neighborhood we grew up in, our education, our life experiences, all these things shape us into who we are. And then we think if somebody looks up and to the right, oh, it means like this. It means this for everybody. It's nonsense. One of the best ways to gauge people is to have conversations with them that are not threatening. Or if you know these people, then you kind of get a sense of what their norm is. You assess them. So if somebody you talk to is always got, I'm going to do it in reverse. They always sit like this. This is just who they are. And then you, let's say it's your significant other. Then all of a sudden you ask your significant other, what did you do last night? Oh, what did I do last night? That's a pause. That's a moment where you have to look at that and say, wait a minute, what just happened there? I did it in reverse because most people expect it's going to be the hands that cross. I did it the opposite. 
That's how you assess people. I just asked something or said something. And in this moment, they shifted. Another great way to assess truthfulness is when people are telling you a story. And if in parts of that story, there is detail, they're giving you detail, for example, what they ate last night. But then you ask them, you know, what time did you come home or who did you come home with? And it starts to get super vague. That's a red flag. So you can remember what was in your food or what you ate for dinner, but you can't remember the rest. So it's lying by amnesia. Most people love to lie through amnesia. I don't remember. It's fuzzy. I'm not really sure. Lying or the way people typically deceive is they leave a lot of gaps. So actually, when I did interviews, we would often say, I would, I would get statements from people, right? written analysis, which was another really great way for me to assess who I needed to talk to. Because sometimes we would have multiple suspects and police would come to me and say, look, we think it was like a child abuse case, for example. Like a, we, I, there would be cases, I remember one case, they were like, we have no idea who it is. It could be the dad, the nanny, uh, the other nanny, the, the grandparents, we don't know. And so I would say to them, can you get written statements from everybody and ask each person to tell you what they did from the time they woke up to the time they went to bed that day? And through reading statements, I could see, sometimes I could see who did it. Mm. And you could see the language they would use. And whenever you would see a gap in time or where things would start to be like, I have amnesia, or the whole thing is very, very vague, that was a red flag. And another thing you can look at is when you ask somebody a question, if they don't start, if they don't say, for example, in one scenario, it was, a, it was a case, I think this was another, sadly, another child abuse case, and I wanted to know what the mom was doing. So I said, get me a statement of what the mother did from the time she woke up to the time she went to bed. And her statement was, went to the store, went shopping, hung out with my friends, uh, studied uh, and watched TV. Everything she wrote, none of those statements had I in them. I went to the store. I studied. I watched TV. I this. And so that was a huge red flag because she was not committing to anything. And so I was like, I want to talk to her. Because when you do interviews and interrogations, when you're dealing with criminal cases, you always want to start with the person you think did it, your most likely suspect. It's not, you don't build towards it because then that gives stuff away. You actually go straight to the person you actually think did it. And so in this scenario, I was like, I need the person who I actually feel did it. And so I went to her because she was not committed to anything she wrote on paper. That's so interesting. This lying for, 101. For sure. Another <laughs> podcast episode we have to do. I'm like, this is lying 101. <laughs> yes. He's lying to me now. I got to look around the room. <laughs> Usually, I will tell you this. The best indicators for lying are verbal, typically. But I will tell you this. And this is really important for people. It so goes back to trusting yourself. Feel people. You feel people. Feel their vibration. If they feel wrong, it is wrong. Please listen to that. Don't rationalize it in your head. Sometimes it just is. And what you feel in your intuition, your instincts, however you want to label it, it is your body. It is your soul telling you, I can't break this down for you, but it's your little warning mechanism saying, be careful, be cautious. All I'm saying is listening to that. Listen to that. Don't dismiss it. Don't because you can't articulate it to yourself because sometimes what you feel is responding faster. It's your body and your mind doing it faster before your consciousness has had time to put it together. That's why it's so important. Trust, trust, trust in you. And the more you trust and you listen to it, the better you're going to be. Feel people. If they feel bad, listen to that. And here's another tip. One other thing is, just because somebody is good to somebody else, it does not mean they're going to be good to you. And this goes into that whole toxic people. People aren't toxic all the time and to everyone. They may be toxic for you. And that is why it's super important for you to identify you're fine with them, but you're not fine for me. You know, the worst is people who like shapeshift based on who you can possibly be to them. So I was at an event a few days ago and my friend that invited me wasn't there yet. So I was feeling quite like quite socially anxious and nervous, but I worked up the courage to go to a group and try to talk to them. And the lady was not interested in me at all. She was just not happy that I had joined their group. And then these two girls came and they were like, Erica, you're from TikTok. And they were so excited to talk to me. And then suddenly that lady was like, oh, 
I want to learn more about you. And it was like these people will shape shift too. And like you're saying, just because they're good to the person next to you or good to you, does you have to really watch how they are to other people too. You should have a really good radar for people. Look at how people treat you and let her shape shift. But you see people reveal themselves to you. Give them space to reveal themselves and then make your assessment of them. Mm. But don't be, I always say this to people, you're the bouncer at the club. You know, when you go to the club or the bar, there's somebody out the front door and they ask for your name and then they decide whether they're going to let you in or not. They look on the guest list. That is you. And you decide who goes in and how long they stay for. But if you just open the velvet rope and you let everybody in and you're like, everybody, come on in. Oh, I don't care that there's mud on your shoes. You can go muddy up all my sofas and my furniture. And then you're like, look what they're doing to my place. I don't believe this. You're the one who let them in. You also have the ability as a bouncer to say, hey, time for you to go. You cannot be naive to the world. You cannot be naive to the fact that there are people who have their own self-interests and the pursuit of their own self-interests, even good people, may cause you harm. They may make choices or decisions that are not to your benefit and to your detriment. You cannot be naive to that. And you cannot be naive to the fact that there are people who are malevolent, who mean you harm. I would see it all the time. People who cause serious harm or injury to another human being. That's why we have law enforcement. That's why we have prison systems. That's why we have a correctional facility. That's why it's called corrections. The idea is you go in there and you correct your behavior, which sadly, not in not all cases, it works because the system needs work. It needs revamping. But that is what people need to focus on. They have to understand that you can't come to the world and be like, I expect everybody to treat me good because I treat them good. No. It is, not, it is not truth. And that's how we open ourselves up to being violated, to being taken advantage of and hurt. You're responsible to yourself to do the right thing by yourself, to yourself, honor yourself, and then choose who I let in and who I push out and who stays and for how long they stay. That was one of the things I was going to ask you because I'm, for my own friend circle, I've been thinking about this too, like, People that have been in my life for 10, 12 years, I still love them. And there's it's always been give and take. But I'm also in a different phase in my life. I find that now if I am in a room full of lawyers, I don't feel like I have as much in common with them. And it's not like they've done anything wrong. Like nothing has happened with our friendship. It's just I don't have as much in common with them. Is that a reason to pop them out of my friend circle? Or is that rude to do that? Or I would not because. They don't. Here's the thing. I look at it two ways because my 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 world always also evolved. Actually, the majority of the friends I had growing up, I don't have them in my life. It just over time, they phased out. A lot of it had to do because I went into law enforcement and then the Secret Service and I was working all the time. And I, but I loved my job. And I remember some friends and a couple I lost because I wasn't around to go out as much. So when they were going to the bars and clubs, because I, I started very young at this uh, job. They would actually get upset with me. In fact, one of my friend's moms called my mom to complain at the time because <laughs> your daughter won't go out with my friend, you know, with my daughter anymore. She's really mad at her. You know, my mother came to me. She said, you know, so-and-so is mad at you. I said, mom, I was in Egypt with President Bush. I, what, what would you like me to do? And so organically, I ended up losing friends. They couldn't understand my life. I think that will happen. If you have people, though, that you love and when you can create space, make space for them. But sometimes as you're moving and through the motion of what you're doing, you want to make space for new people to come in also that give you value as well. So I'm not saying push them out like just because they don't serve you anymore. You can't have a conversation with them because a friendship also is let me sit and listen to you as well. But it goes back to how do you feel when you're around them? Do you like being around them? Do you enjoy their company? Do you feel good? Do you feel grounded? Wonderful. If you feel off or you feel that you may deal with from time to time envy or people dismiss what you do or suppress or they show no interest in what you do because it makes them feel uncomfortable, well, that is that a friendship? I've absolutely loved our conversation. I was quite nervous actually going into this because... I've learned a lot from listening to you speak and but I you also do have a way of reading people that I felt like I had to be like when 
it, earlier on in the interview, we were talking about when people confess to crimes to you. And I felt like then blurting out my one bad thing I've done, which is when I was younger, I stole Tic Tacs from the store and my mom caught me and made me go back to the store and apologize and return it. So I just wanted to confess that to you. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you are. How, did, how do you feel about that? I feel bad that I did it, but honestly, I don't remember the act of stealing. I just remember getting scolded and caught and having to go apologize. I love your mom, by yeah. the way, for making you do that. <laughs> it's actually a really great parenting thing she did because she made it significant enough so you could go back, so you could feel the guilt that you did something bad so that you would not do it again. And that yeah. changes our behavior. Because that's all I remember. I don't remember taking it. I just remember getting scolded. But anyways, I, I have adored this conversation. I really have so much respect for you, everything you've accomplished, but also just how this podcast I know is going to help a lot of people and everything from relationships to approaching, using these things when you're at work and advocating for yourself and being trusting your gut, I think is one big takeaway that I got from you. So I'm really appreciative for you taking the time to do this the way that I know you're going to help people. I have a closing tradition. Yes. This is the podcast is called Erica Taught Me, but really today is about Evie Taught Me. So what do you want people to walk away from this podcast being able to say, Evie taught me this? Evie taught me to trust myself. Evie taught me to listen to my inner voice. Whether I'm right or wrong, I choose. That's what Evie taught me. I love that. Thank you so much. If you've enjoyed the episode, please take a moment to leave a review. It really helps support what we're doing. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you next Tuesday on a brand new episode of Erica Taught Me.